This lecture is Part B of the Shoulder Lecture, and we're going to address special rehab applications to specific diagnoses. To start off with, we'll look at shoulder instabilities. Um, stability of the shoulder is typically um, through some static um, restraints, such as capsules, bone, um, as well as dynamic restraints through, through muscles and ligaments. But um, injury to either type of the restraints will cause changes in the neural input and even add to more instability. And typically with the shoulder we'll see an anterior instability, um, which is the most, the most common. So the shoulder might subluxate or dislocate where the head of the humerus comes anterior um, to the glenoid fossa. Here's a couple of pictures. Um, here's an anterior dislocation that remains dislocated, and you can see how the clavicle sticks out as the humeral head came anterior and medial um, in the fossa. Uh, in your notes, you'll see that we have a couple um, different terms that you'll want to be aware of. Um, the first one is called an AMBRI, which stands for an atraumatic multidirectional bilateral Rehab effective, meaning rehabilitation can help with the problem. Inferior capsule shift required. We don't see this one as common. Um, what we see much more common is what is called the Tubbs injury or a traumatic unilateral, so one side, bank heart lesion. Um, and we'll talk about what that is here in a minute. Um, surgery required. So what we've got then with a bank heart lesion is a tear in the anterior um, um, capsule of the shoulder here um, as well as a tear um, of the labrum of the glenoid fossa. So um, they'll come in and do a bank heart repair which means that um, the surgery is such that um, the torn joint capsule is um, trimmed away, this is the anterior portion, and um, holes then are drilled to the edge of the glenoid cavity, so right on the edge there, and then those ligaments are pulled back in and sutured back into place. So um, it's tightening up the capsule, essentially, and it's on the anterior portion. Um, this can typically be done um, through three types of um, methods where we tighten up the capsule, or the capsule is tightened up. The first one in um, in your notes that you need to write down is an open procedure and this is the picture that you have in front of you is an open procedure to tighten up the capsule which is called a bank heart repair. Um, so the shoulder is actually you know, has an incision from here down towards the um, the armpit and um, the shoulder is laid open so that the capsule can be exposed and sutured together. The other way they can do this now, which is more common, is an arthroscopic procedure. And on Moodle, there is a link, and you can watch a um, bank heart repair uh, surgery done um, arthroscopically, which is pretty interesting. The third way is an electrothermal um, procedure. And with an electrothermal procedure, um, typically what they're doing is going in um, with a type of a laser and um, they apply the heat into this area and um, and then it's immobilized for a period of time um, while these tissues tighten up and then they start rehab. So there's um, just a couple scope holes. Um, it's a, a fairly effective um, surgery, just depends on the, the patient and what their demands are. So. Um, We'd, we'd joke around in rehab, we'd call it the shrinky dink surgery because it's, I don't know if you've used shrinky dinks, but it's like a plastic and when you apply heat to it or put the shrinky dinks in the oven, they shrink down um, to about a fraction of the size that they were. So um, it's used to treat chronic subluxations and dislocations. Um, in the rehab, the external rotation and abduction are going to be limited for a period of time. Um, while the tissues heal, but not nearly as long as if they did an open procedure. You'll start uh, scapula stabilization exercises um, very early, and normal motion can return in anywhere from one to two months, except for external rotation, which is typically limited um, for 15 degrees of normal as a precautionary um, guide so that this doesn't re-rip or overstretch again. 
And if the athlete or the patient is such that they would need plyometric training, that can begin at about three months or 12 weeks post-op. Um, <clears throat> So when we talk about considerations for patients with overhead throwing sports, so if we've got a baseball player, um, softball, um, some volleyball, uh, swimmers that have um, an instability, it's, it's most often um, an anterior instability, and um, the posterior capsule is tight, um, and rotator cuff is typically weak. So we'll have those general things that we have to address. Um, when we look at the rehab on an anterior um, dislocation, this is in your, your notes where it says anterior, um, abduction and external rotation are going to be limited um, by the surgeon. So they'll tell you how much range of motion you can get back by week um, three post-op, and then by week six, how much external rotation you can work on. It has to come back slowly so that it doesn't overstretch in the surgery is not effective. So when you, you do rehab with um, a post-op um, capsular repair, you need to remember that for an anterior dislocation, there's certain exercises that need to be avoided. So these exercises um, all would cause the anterior um, movement of the um, glenoid or the uh, humeral head into the fossa. So we don't want to encourage that. Um, so exercises like push-ups where you bring the chest all the way down to the floor so the elbows are behind the shoulders, those are avoided. Um, bench press, similar motion, military press, those are all exercises that we'll avoid with um, anterior subluxation or dislocations. Um, pull downs where they pull the bar down to the front of their chest so the elbows come behind. Um, again, it's the same mechanism as a push-up so those are avoided. And then um, a fly, um, and um, the part that we don't like about an anterior fly is when the arms are ab horizontally abducted and the hands come posterior to the line of the shoulder or posterior to the frontal plane, um, so they're behind the shoulder if the patient's in supine. Um, and again, that would cause the humeral head to, to glide forward. Um, on the fossa. If they had a posterior dislocation or subluxation, we'll avoid internal rotation and horizontal adduction, as that's the position that they're most unstable in. Exercises to avoid that put them in that position then, of course, would be um, push-ups at the very end, the uh, where they're on the, the arms are extended. Um, bench, um, especially if it's a close grip when their elbows um, are extended on a bench press. Um, they avoid any weight bearing through their arms, so um, like a push-up position. And then again when they're doing um, chest flies, so they bring their arms in a horizontal adduction um, and the arms are straight in front of them in a supine position. And um, if they relax the shoulder musculature at all, um, they're at a high ri higher risk of uh, injuring that shoulder because they're in an internal rotation and horizontally adducted motion. So no um, bench, no push-ups, no chest flies, and no weight bearing through the upper extremities post-surgically, um, or even before surgery. Um, we'll avoid those positions as well. If they had an inferior dislocation, we'll avoid full elevation because when they go into full elevation, the humeral head drops inferior. So um, exercises to avoid will be the military press where their arms are way up above. We also avoid shrugs um, because it pulls the scapula up and the humeral head remains down. And then elbow or bicep curls with the arm by your side. When you contract the bicep, the bicep tendon comes over the anterior portion of the humerus. And when it contracts, it can push the humeral head into an inferior position related to the glenoid uh, fossa. So, um, elbow or bicep curls, military press, and shrugs are avoided. Um, Post-surgical rehab can be anywhere from um, 15 to 26 weeks, depending on what... Um, what they had to do in the surgery, but it's an extensive surgery. It's pretty involved. Um, eventually, again, this is a situation where you're towards the end of surgery, you're going to be working on eccentric loading um, before they return to their sport because lots of upper extremity sports um, will require eccentric loading in the, 
in a throwing motion. All right, moving on to um, labral tears. Uh, a slap lesion is um, a common lesion in the shoulder related to um, the labrum. And a, the slap, S-L-A-P, stands for superior labral tear anterior to posterior in direction. So the, the tear started anteriorly and it kept moving posteriorly and it's in the superior portion of the labrum. So that's called a slap lesion. lesion. Um, the reason that we see this more common than any other part of the labrum is because the bicep tendon, and this is the blank in your notes, the long head of the biceps attaches here. Um, so if we have a quick contraction or an eccentric contraction um, of great force or a lot of repetitive force, uh, we'll see the bicep tendon will start to kind of pull that um, labrum off of the superior portion of the labrum. Uh, we see this a lot in baseball um, pitchers. So I think I heard a statistic that said 80% um, of the major league baseball pitchers um, probably have a labrum tear. Now, not all of them are repaired, of course, um, but they have some tearing of that. Um, it's primarily due to second, secondary to deceleration forces in throwing. Uh, it's difficult to diagnose. It can mimic a lot of um, different kinds of shoulder problems. And then do we fix it? Um, do we not? Um, here's a picture of the bicep long head tendon as it comes up and attaches into the labrum right here. And again, repetitive pulling can, can pull that labrum down. But they, they can be repaired. Um, here's um, essentially what they do is they go in they to the anterior portion, they staple down um, the labrum back down to the glenoid fossa. Um, and it's done arthroscopically as well. Um, the rehab, I should go back, the rehab for a slap repair lesion is dictated extremely um, close by the surgeon because they know what needs to be done. Um, we'll be limiting range of motion until the surgeon says what can be returned um, and when and how fast. So there's lots of different protocols out there. Usually surgeons have their own and they, the patient comes back to rehab with a specific protocol. Um, stating which exercises. So I'm not going to give a, a general protocol because um, they vary so much. All right, moving on to impingement. Um, impingement can take place in a lot of different areas. Um, so under your notes it says primary impingement, and that's when the narrowing of the subacromial space, so the space between the encomium and the humeral head, is narrowed down. It might be because bone buildup, it might be a thicker acromium here, um, it might be that they, they have um, a larger um, supraspinatus tendon that comes through here. Not this blue one, but um, um, yeah, I guess they are showing that. <laughs> so through uh, the supraspinatus tendon comes through here. Um, it might be thickened, um, hypertrophied, and so that space is narrowed by that. There could also be um, Impingement because of um, oh a bursa that's inflamed here um, in that same area. There could be um, capsule laxity. So there's it's just so much space that the, the humeral head just kind of knocks around in here. We've got a vein of supraspinatus tendon here up against the chromium. There's just too much movement. Um, oddly enough, though, it can be such too that it's too tight, and when the um, athlete goes to raise their arm. Um, there's not enough space, uh, and the capsule is so tight that it pinches um, in that area. So it can be because of a hypermobile or a hypomobile. Posture can play into it, so if they have a forward shoulder posture, the anterior portion of the humerus is slid forward. Um, it changes the alignment of the rotator cuff such that um, it gets pinched more easily. And if you go into a forward slump shoulder posture now as you're sitting there and try to raise your arms overhead, um, you can't go very far um, before your, your shoulder will start to um, approximate and up against the acromion process and limit your motion. Um, however, if you squeeze your scapula back, sit up straight, um, you're able to get your arm overhead much further um, and avoid pinching of the rotator cuff in there. Um, 
It can also um, be due to scapular weakness. Um, again, that would play into the posture. And then also rotator cuff weakness. It just can't handle the load that's being required um, of that athlete or the um, patient. Uh, I'm going to go back and make sure that, oh yeah, your symptoms, I have that in your notes. Symptoms are inflammation, um, tendonitis, usually of the supraspinatus and the long head of the biceps. And then um, you might have some inflammation of the bursa uh, right over here. The um, subacromial bursa can be inflamed. If it goes on long enough, the inflammation, um, you can get a tear in the actual musculature. So... Um, uh, this one's of the supraspinatus and part, um, partially of the infraspinatus. Here's your teres minor down here. And so those will, of course, then um, need to be repaired. So, um, but treatment considerations, if we look at all those factors um, that could be a part of this, we've got um, correcting the posture is important. Um, you might have to use some inferior mobilizations if they are limited in range of motion, especially um, elevation, you might have to use some posterior mobilizations, especially if they have decreased internal rotation. And usually if it's, if it's 20 degrees or more um, limited than the opposite side, then we consider that a significant um, limitation and posterior mobilizations would be required. Uh, scapula stabilization, so strengthening the middle and lower traps um, eccentrically as well. Uh, rotator cuff strengthening uh, is very important, especially of the external rotation, which is typically um, weaker, but that being of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus and teres. Um, PNF strengthening, so PNF um, diagonals can be helpful in strengthening these muscles. And you might even have to strengthen their core. Core testing shows some weakness. So they had a good foundation to use the distal extremity on. So kind of like in the legs, we did a core testing. Um, what's the foundation look like for the lower extremities? The core can also affect upper extremities. So um, I don't think where they are. Oh, there's just a uh, yeah, picture of the splint that is typically utilized post-surgically. It's called an airplane splint. Um, this is after repair of a rotator cuff, and they need to keep those tissues approximated so they keep the um, shoulder up into abduction, and then slowly over time they'll actually lower that. So I might be up here for a few weeks and then lower it down 30 more degrees. Um, again, the sur if they have a repair, the surgeon's going to be sending some pretty significant and restricted guidelines um, a protocol with. So I think there might be one in your book, though, if you're ever in a situation where you need one and you don't have one, there's um, one in the book. Adhesive capsulitis, commonly referred to as frozen shoulder. Um, it's an arthrofibrosis. Um, that's a general term for adhesions in the capsule, and an adhesion is an inflammation or thickening in the shoulder capsule. Cause um, is idiopathic, we don't know. Um, it might be micro tears, it might be decreased vascularization. There's really no known cause um, across the board. Typically, they have a capsular um, pattern loss of motion, um, so we see the most significant restriction in external rotation, um, then more limited in abduction and flexion being limited as well in that order. Um, they get better with treatment, so lots of joint mobilizations, lots of stretching with heat. Um, they have to really work on this, though it just isn't a visit or two a week to a PT to do mobilizations. They have a lot of daily stretches, um, trying to loosen that up, it will tighten down often overnight, so they might even use a splint um, overnight to keep the mo motion that they have. Um, if, no, if they don't have treatment, it will get better on its own, um, but it can take up to two years. And typically people don't want to deal with not being able to elevate their shoulder for that long, um, and it becomes painful. So it's best if they can get in and start getting some treatment going um, and learn the exercises, again, for range of motion. You'll be doing a lot of, um, lot of joint mobilizations, and then as the motion starts to improve, it's lots of strengthening exercises um, coming back.
Um, here's another picture, just a cartoony picture. Um, typically the scarring will start on the inferior portion um, and they aren't able to elevate or externally rotate. There's a person in the compensation that they do when they have adhesive capsulitis. So he's being asked to raise his arm. He can't do it from the glenohumeral joint, so he starts to use his whole trunk in order to get the arm up, and that's about as far as he can go. Um, AC sprains, so acromioclavicular sprains, are divided typically into um, three grades. So um, a slight separation, we've got more of a separation with a tear. Um, and then a grade three is we have the AC the chromioclavicular ligament is torn as well as the coracoclavicular ligaments um, have shown um, tearing in them too. So we have a little bit of elevation of the clavicle, um, hardly visible though. The grade 2 is more elevation and grade 3 is significantly elevated and um, in fact when you push down on the end of the clavicle it kind of rebounds up. That's called a piano key. Um, so like when you play piano you can push the key down and it just rebounds back up a key, piano key sign. Um, rehab for this is actually um, it's a strengthening of the shoulder musculature and the scapula musculature. Surgery is usually not required um, or done because it doesn't make them any more functional and um, some deformities still exist. The only one that I've ever seen um, post-surgical is from a gal that did it because of cosmetic reasons. She didn't want the clavicle sticking way up um, when she wore tank tops. So she asked the surgeon to go in and suture it down and so they did. Um, I don't know that it made a significant difference because now she had a pretty big scar and was having trouble getting her range of motion back. But um, So you won't see these post-surgically very often. Just get them strong, get the range of motion back as the healing um, timeline allows and they usually do pretty well. Um, biceps tendon injury is the last one here. Uh, usually it's a tendonitis. Um, biceps tendon, uh, the short head goes to the coracoid process, the long head goes up um, onto the superior portion of the labrum. Uh, we talked about that being involved with the slap lesion. Usually it's the long head that's involved in a tendonitis um, of some type. Um, and partially because it's got a really big role in depressing the glenohumeral joint or the head of the, the um, humerus um, when you go into elevation. So when you um, bring your arm into flexion and abduction, the biceps, it does that motion and the mechanics of the shoulder are great because as that muscle contracts, it'll push the humeral head down or inferior in the fossa, allowing a greater acromial space up here so you can get your arm into full elevation. Um, it's by an engineering design, um, it's, it's really remarkable and um, so God did a cool thing, especially at the long head of the biceps. Um, when you're rehabbing um, somebody with a bicep tendon injury, um, usually you're going to be doing strengthening of shoulder flexion as long as it's pain, pain free, but also we'll do um, elbow flexion, contracts the bicep muscle as well and working on supination um, because the um, bicep is a supinator of the forearm. So those are two motions that you need to remember as well. All right, the case study on the shoulder um, is a shoulder impingement. You can read through the um, subjective and objective information. And um, this is what we'll be going over in class on Tuesday with the group um, after you get your um, sheets of paper. Um, so with an impingement, um, we'll be doing lots of strengthening of the scapula and the shoulder. We're going to pick out some specific muscles, so write down which ones you think that you would um, strengthen and how you would do that. We'll be doing some joint mobs, so I'll review that um, in case you get called up to do that. And um, we'll see where we go from here. This is a pretty common um, injury or diagnosis that we'll see, so that's why I chose this one. So we'll see you on Tuesday.